Welcome to another exciting episode of Digging for Truth, and I'm your host, Scott Lancer, the Director of Associates for Biblical Research. Our special guest today is Brian Windle, and Brian is a pastor at the Island Bible Chapel up, uh, up in Ontario, Canada, and Brian is the newest member of the ABR staff, and so Brian, I want to welcome you here today. Thanks, Scott. It's great to be here. Yeah, all right. Now, Brian, we're going to get uh, right into the, the fun stuff because we're going we're gonna to talk about these extraordinary discoveries related to the New Testament, the top 10 discoveries uh, in biblical archaeology. So, uh, Brian, we're going we're gonna, to we're start with that, but I, I think it's always helpful to explain to, to our viewers um, how you decided to, you know, you, you've selected 10 great discoveries, what was your criteria in doing so? Sure. Well, I, when I decided to do a top 10 list, I thought it was going to be a top 10 list of the top 10 discoveries of all time. But there were just too many. And so I broke it into two lists, Old Testament and New Testament. And, and so when I looked at the top 10 discoveries of all time relating to the New Testament, I used this criteria. It had to be directly related to a person, uh, place, or event uh, in the New Testament. Um, or secondly, it had to be directly related to the composition of the New Testament itself. And I should probably note before we begin that I've focused on uh, artifacts and inscriptions and discoveries that are largely accepted by the, um, by the academic world. And so I've avoided ones that are debatable or, or highly controversial, like um, the Tomb of Jesus, which site is the Tomb of Jesus, or the James Ossuary, or the Shroud of Turin. And so you won't see those in this list. There are some good articles at BibleArchaeology.org on those, and I have my own feelings on them, but I tried to narrow my list for this one. Very good, very good. Well, let's begin by counting, town, uh, counting down the uh, top 10 discoveries for the New Testament. Um, which ones did you choose for number 10 and number nine? Well, number 10, I chose the Sergius Paulus inscriptions. And um, in Acts chapter 13, we read about how Saul and Barnabas set off on a mission trip and ended up on the island of Cyprus. And when they arrived at Paphos, we're told that they led the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, to faith in Christ. Hmm. And there have been numerous Sergius Paulus inscriptions that have been discovered. Hmm. Uh, one was discovered in 1877 near Paphos, which mentions the proconsul Paulus. Now, another one um, was found from a few years later that, that names Lucius Sergius Paulus as one of the cu uh, curators of the Tiber River uh, under the Emperor Claudius. And finally, probably the most famous one is the one from Pisidian Antioch, mm -hmm. which names an L. Sergius Paulus. And all three of these inscriptions affirm that uh, Sergius Paulus was the proconsul of uh, Cyprus. The one confirms that he was there at the time the Bible uh, describes him there, and also affirms that he was a, a very important person from a very influential family in the Roman Empire right at the time the Bible says he was. Very good. Yeah, I think what's important for our viewers is um, we're looking at people, places, events, and these discoveries form a matrix of evidence that actually becomes overwhelming. So that if a, if a, a student is questioning whether or not the Bible is true, the evidence here, even from this particular discovery, uh, the evidence, when you, when you put all the pieces together, including this one, then you have this strong matrix of evidence and the biblical accounts are strongly affirmed. And uh, so we can maybe, we'll circle around and talk about that at the, at the conclusion today. But let's talk about uh, uh, the number nine, which is the Pool of Siloam, uh, tremendous discovery. Absolutely. We, we looked at a person. Now we're looking at a place. And um, so in John chapter 9, Jesus heals the blind man by putting mud on his eyes and telling him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. Now visitors to Jerusalem have long visited the 5th century Byzantine pool of Siloam that had been built to commemorate the miracle. It's, it's at the end of Hezekiah's tunnel, the aqueduct that brings water from the Gihon Spring into the city. But the exact location of the Pool of Siloam from Jesus' day was not known. They thought it was in a particular location, but it wasn't really known until 2004. 
um, when they were doing some repairs on a drainage system and discovered a couple of ancient steps. And when the archaeologists were called in, they excavated, and what they discovered was a large pool um, with at least 20 steps leading down from the street into the pool. Pottery from one end of it dated it to the first century, and pottery um, and stuff from the other end uh, dated it to the Old Testament period, and it was identified by archaeologists as the Pool of Siloam. And so it is uh, the place where, uh, likely the place where the blind man had washed to receive his healing. Very good, very good. Well, we have a, a couple minutes here, Brian, and we're going to cover uh, number eight, number seven, uh, the Erastus inscription. Tell us about that. Sure. Well, the Bible describes um, when um, when the Apostle Paul wrote his letter to the Romans, he did that from Corinth, and he sends greetings from a man named Erastus, the city treasurer. Now, the Greek word for treasurer there is oikonomos, which means a manager or a steward. Uh, it's a general term. It can be used for a high-ranking city official or even for a slave who is a steward in a house. Um, and it's likely a term that the Apostle Paul used to describe the job Erastus was doing rather than his official title. Yes. And in 1929, archaeologists were excavating in Corinth, and they came across this large paving stone, and on it was this um, inscription that says, Erastus, in return for his edelship, laid this pavement at his own expense. And those seven-inch high letters would have been filled with bronze at one time. They're mm. gone now. And an edel was a, an elected official who maintained public buildings, kept the streets in good order, oversaw the market, managed the local games, the Isthmian games. And so while a, an edel and an oikonomos aren't exactly equivalent terms, the term oikonomos would, would describe the work that an edel do, does. And so Erastus, that's laid this paving stone at his own expense, was likely the Erastus, the city treasurer, that the Apostle Paul mentions and sends his greetings to the church in Rome from Corinth. All right. Brian, we only have a few seconds here to introduce the Caiaphas ossuary. Maybe we can come back to this, but why don't you let us know why that discovery is so important? Sure. Well, an ossuary is a stone box that uh, for a very brief period in history, in the first century AD, Jews would 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 take the bones of the deceased and put them in these bone boxes. And so um, on this particular bone box, they discovered the name of Caiaphas. It was discovered in 1990. Uh, by a, a construction uh, team that was building a water park, actually. A bulldozer plowed through the roof of a first century tomb. In came the archaeologists. They found this ossuary that had the bones of a 60-year-old man in it. Yeah. And Josephus records that the full name of, jo uh, of Caiaphas was Joseph Caiaphas. And on this ornate um, ossuary was the, the phrase, Joseph, son of Caiaphas. And scholars think this is the very st bone box and even the physical remains of the high priest who presided over the trial of Jesus in the Gospels. Very good, Brian. All right. Well, we appreciate everyone tuning in today for, to, for this fascinating discussion, and we will be right back. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the Scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Well, welcome back to Digging for Truth. Uh, we're here today with Brian Wendell, and we're talking about the top 10 discoveries in biblical archaeology that relate to the New Testament. And we're right in the middle of the list, Brian. Uh, we want to talk about uh, number six and then number five. Uh, number six being the temple inscription. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about that? 
Sure. Well, when you read the Gospels, you see that Jesus spent a lot of time uh, at the temple with his disciples. And so uh, any discoveries related to the temple, um, the Jewish holy site, are of utmost importance. And two inscriptions have been found. Uh, The first one is called the Temple Warning Inscription. Um, Josephus describes the temple in great detail, and he describes how um, a Gentile, like me, if I was to get in a time machine and go back to Uh, first century Jerusalem, I could only go into the court of the Gentiles. And then there was this wall with these warning inscriptions, warning that Gentiles couldn't go any further on pain of death. And we have actually found one of those inscriptions uh, was discovered in 1871. It reads, no foreigner is to enter within the railing and enclosure around the temple, and whoever is caught will be responsible for his subsequent death. I mean, think about this. Jesus would have walked past this particular stone probably numerous times. And um, the temple warning inscriptions also help explain why in the book of Acts, um, the Jews were so furious when they mistakenly thought that Paul had brought Trophimus the Ephesian past that mm-hmm. um, past that uh, wall into the inner uh, sanctuary. And the other thing that's really interesting is that when Paul talked about the dividing wall of hostility being taken down in, in this book of Ephesians, most scholars think he's probably referring to that wall that barred the Gentiles from going to worship further where the Jews could worship. And so the temple warning inscription is an important one. There's another one, the, the trumpeting inscription um, in 68, archaeologist Benjamin Mazar uh, discovered a three-foot-long piece of uh, stone, a block that had fallen from, been thrown from the temple courts above when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. And on it was an inscription that said, to the place of trumpeting. Again, Josephus describes how the priests would blow the trumpets. And so these two um, inscriptions are the clearest archaeological evidence we have testifying to the second temple, and really the closest we can get to that hallowed place of Jewish worship in the first century, the place Jesus was really familiar with. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, let's keep moving. Number five is the Nazareth inscription. This is a really, really fascinating uh, inscription. It's a marble slab with a Greek inscription. It was found in Nazareth, and it's an edict of Caesar dating to the reign of Claudius, and it imposes a death penalty in Israel to anyone who is caught stealing bodies from family tombs, specifically sepulcher sealing tombs like the one Jesus was buried in. And uh, what's really interesting is this, why would Caesar feel the need to make such a decree? I mean, tombs were robbed in antiquity, but they didn't take the bodies, they took the treasures. The bodies were left. That's why we have so many Egyptian pharaohs, but but hardly any of their treasures, right? Mm-hmm. And so um, this particular inscription seems to be directed at Jews. Now, what situation could explain this particular uh, artifact? Well, the Bible records that the Jewish leaders uh, made up this story and started spreading it around that the disciples had stolen Jesus' body when he rose from the dead. And likely this particular news report had reached um, Caesar's ears, and uh, he might have seen this new Christian sect as a dangerous anti-Roman movement. And Dr. Clyde Billington has studied this, and, uh, and he concludes that the context of the Nazareth inscription clearly proves it was written for Jews and not Gentiles, and that it was almost certainly issued by Claudius in response to the story of the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth from the dead. Exciting, exciting uh, inscription. We're down already to number four, uh, the Gallio inscription. Brian, tell us about this. Well, the Apostle Paul spent a year and a half in Corinth on his second missionary journey. And in Acts 18, verse 2, we read that, that when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal. Well, this particular inscription, the Gallio inscription, also called the Delphi inscription, was discovered at Delphi, Greece, and it is uh, an inscription by Claudius the Emperor in which he references Junius Gallio, my friend and proconsul, and what's really exciting about it is it's actually dated to, um, he mentions that he had been acclaimed imperator for the 26th time, so that dates it to between January and August of 52 A.D., 
-hmm. So knowing that, we now have a chronological anchor that allows us to date most of what happened to the Apostle Paul because proconsuls only served for one year's time. And so likely the Apostle Paul was brought before Gallio in 51 AD, and then we can just do the math from the chronological markers in the book of Acts. It's an exciting find that helps us with that. Very good, Brian. Very good. All right. Well, we're down to our final minute here of this segment. Uh, Brian, we want to talk about the pilot stone. And we talked about the pilot ring in another, uh, another episode, but the pilot stone. Tell, tell us why that's important. Well, one of the most infamous figures in all of the New Testament is undoubtedly Pontius Pilate, the man who sentenced Jesus to death. And his historicity has never really been in doubt. I mean, he's mentioned by writers such as Josephus and Philo and others, in addition to the gospel accounts. But archaeological evidence for his existence was discovered in 1961 when they found a stone uh, that was inscribed. It was part of a dedication for Tiberius Caesar, and it was it was put there by Pontius Pilate, Prefect of Judea. That's what it says. And um, what's really interesting about this stone is not just that it's archaeological confirmation that um that uh, Pilate was a historical person, but it confirms his title because uh, Tacitus um, mistakenly calls him a proconsul, uh, but he was actually a prefect, and this confirms that that's what he is. Interestingly, the, the New Testament doesn't use a, a specific term for him. It just calls him a, a hegemenos, which means a leader, and so the Bible was accurate just with a general term, and so uh, just incredible archaeological evidence for an actual historical figure in the New Testament. Amen. Very good, Brian. Well, we, we are here today with Brian Wendell, and we're talking about the top 10 discoveries in biblical archaeology related to the New Testament, and we will be right back. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research, written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint. Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must-read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Welcome back to Digging for Truth. Uh, we're with Brian Wendell today talking about the top 10 discoveries in biblical archaeology related to the New Testament. And Brian, it's hard to believe, but we're already at number two. And uh, uh, this discovery is quite extraordinary. What, I, what excited me was that we have a, a manuscript uh, in the top 10 list. And the manuscripts of the New Testament are always uh, important to, to examine and to understand. Let's talk about this one. Sounds good. Well, the number two discovery of all time related to the New Testament is uh, the John Rylands Library Papyrus, or P52 as it's known. It's a, it's a small fragment of the New Testament that contains part of John 18, uh, verses 31 to 33 on one side and verse 37 to 38 on the other. What's exciting is that this has been dated um, to about 125 to 150, maybe 175 A.D., now, early church history records that the Apostle John wrote, did his writing late in the first century AD. So this means we have a copy that dates to within a hundred years after it was written. Moreover, this papyrus piece of this manuscript was discovered um, in Egypt which is quite far away from Ephesus. And so already within 100 years, we see that gospel manuscripts were being copied and widely distributed um, in that particular time. And here's what's so exciting about manuscripts um, is this. To date, we have uh, over 5,800 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. I mean, we have thousands more if you consider the translations into other languages um, like Latin and Coptic and Syria, Syrian and Ar Armenian and that sort of thing. But here's the thing. We actually have an astounding 2.6 million 
pages of biblical text in the form of ancient manuscripts. We in the church have an embarrassment of riches when it comes mm-hmm. to New Testament and textual criticism. And, and so, and not only just the sheer volume, but our manuscripts go back to within a hundred years now of of the actual original autographs. And so the P52 papyrus is the earliest link in the chain that connects the Bible that we read today back to the very original manuscript that John himself would have written. Yes. Well, the hunt for New Testament papyri will go on. And uh, we, we, are ho- we hope every day for a new announcement of some extraordinary d- discovery. And uh, we will keep an eye on that. Well, we're down to no, our number one uh, discovery uh, in support of the New Testament. And it's the heel bone of a crucified man. What an extraordinary discovery. It's an amazing discovery. I mean, the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus is the most important event to Christians um, around the world and, and Christians of all time. And archaeologically, we now have uh, evidence of Roman crucifixion. Now, we knew about Roman crucifixion from writings. Many writers describe Roman crucifixions, Josephus and Seneca and others. But now we have the actual heel bone of a man who was crucified. In 1968, a construction crew with the Israeli Ministry of Housing was doing some work, and they they went in, dug up several tombs, and they found some ossuaries. And inside was inside one of the ossuaries that had the name on the outside, Yehohanan, was the heel bone with a, a nail still embedded in it. And this allowed us then to analyze Roman crucifixion for the first time through an archaeological artifact. This confirms the biblical description of crucifixion, um, where Jesus, it says he was nailed, um, not just in his hands, but in his feet. Um, Some scholars analyzing the bones suggest that there's evidence that Yehohanan's legs have been broken too. The Bible describes that with Jesus. And, and, And important Another important point is this. Critics often used to say, well, Jesus would never have been buried in in a family tomb. He wouldn't be given the dignity of a burial because he was a criminal. He would have just been thrown in a common grave where they threw all of the crucified criminals. But now we have archaeological evidence that that's not true, that crucified victims could receive proper burials in family tombs, just as the Bible describes Jesus having received. Yes. And Brian, it's interesting, we have all these historical records that affirm that crucifixion was, uh, the, I guess, the chosen form for the Romans to, to execute people. But still the critics would say, well, we haven't really found, we haven't found any evidence. It always seems there's never enough evidence. But this <laughs> is a strong piece yeah. of evidence, really powerful. And again, there, I guess this, maybe there might be one other piece of evidence of a crucified individual. So there isn't a lot of evidence there in terms of the artifact evidence, but this one is extraordinary. And so putting it all together, it gives us clarity on the reality of crucifixion in the first century, that's for sure. Well, Brian, um, you follow the world of biblical archeology span very closely. Uh, What impact have these discoveries had on your faith? Well, when I was a teenager, I got a a Thompson Chain Reference Bible, and at the back of that Bible, there was this uh, archaeological encyclopedia. And at a time as a teenager, when many teenagers are questioning their faith, um, it was really helpful for me to read about a place and then and then to flip back to the back of this little encyclopedia and read about that place and the excavations that went on there, and to see how historically reliable Mm -hmm. the Bible really is. And so even even now, when I'm 46, 47, I don't even remember how old I am, <laughs> we, I still see how my what I accept by faith is being affirmed again and again through discoveries that are made yeah. in biblical archaeology. And, and when we step back and see the cumulative effect of 150 plus years of biblical archaeology, I think the overwhelming testimony is that the Bible is a historically reliable document. And if we can trust it historically, I believe we can trust it spiritually. Mm -hmm. Uh, The stories intersect 
And so the story, the account of God's love for us and sending his son, Jesus, um, to take my place at the cross so that my sins could be forgiven when I ask God for forgiveness and put my faith in Jesus committing to follow him, um, archaeology just just helps affirm that faith again and again. Amen. Well, Brian, I want to thank you for being with us today on Digging for Truth. It's been a a fun excursion into uh, support for the New Testament. And so uh, thanks again for joining us. And I want to thank all of our viewers today for joining us on this exciting episode of Digging for Truth.